All right, good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 11th of January. And uh, we've got a, a slightly shorter agenda tonight because our initial appointment for Franklin County Tech had to be postponed. So we're just gonna uh, quickly go through, we don't have too much on our other things and then we'll, um, we'll get to our library budget presentation. <clears throat> so let's see, we've got Elliot out there tonight. Keith, so <clears throat> um, why don't we do our minutes from last week's meeting? We have a motion on those. Motion. I will second that motion. All right. <clears throat> All those in favor of the minutes from our last week's meeting? Aye. Aye. All right. Three to zero on that one. Close um, one of the 20 windows that are open. That's good. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, and I know uh, Jeff will be doing the update for our um, for the COVID for our uh, Lori, who's not going to be on tonight. So when we get to that part, so um, we're actually getting to that part now. So <laughs> <laughs> I was I was just looking at my, down at my agenda. I've got a, That's a it. separate screen. So hey. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff over at the COVID desk. Jeff. Thank you. Hey. Um, so let's see, on January 5th, uh, there were four positive cases. On the 6th, there were two positive cases. Uh, on the 7th, there were three. On the 8th, there was one, and then uh, today there were seven. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So that's not going to show up uh, for at least an, uh, another week, uh, probably two. So next week we're um, anticipating that, that the state data will show 19 cases, um, which uh, I, I believe is going to keep us uh, no, gre gray is less than 10, green is less than 15, and I think yellow is less than 25. So we might move uh, into the yellow category. And we had some come off Friday, was it, I think? That were yes. Some? They came off? Yep. But yep, unfortunately, we, we apparently get some new ones, unfortunately, so. Yep. <clears throat> um. And so that, that was the EMD's report. And then I just wanted to add uh, two quick things. One is uh, thank you to um, FCAT and, and Jonathan. We were putting information on uh, nearby testing sites that are available uh, to Sunderland residents from the discussion um, last week. week. Yep. And That's then great. also wanted to give an update that starting this week, um, actually, I think the first one is tomorrow, our uh, police and firefighters are going to start getting their first um, dose of the vaccine. Oh, good. Good. The, the priority list. That's right. The 12th, right? That's when it was supposed to start kicking in. So that's great. <clears throat> All right. So on that subject of uh, COVID and updates, Mr. Chair, if I could. Yeah. Uh, the information that was sent out from the office about the uh, penetration or response from the direct calling showed that of the people who are registered, one of the one of the several ways we communicate with the town, uh, there was over eighty three percent or eighty four percent either direct either direct answer or a combination of direct answer and answering machines. So one of the ways that we're communicating is with those uh, code red calls. It used to be CT Connect, and it was reverse nine one one. Now it's code red. <laughs> so anyway, but it was interesting to see those graphics that uh, how well those who are um, registered for that, and if they want to continue to get those, please, you know, contact us and we'll get you registered. Um, 80, again, I think it was 84. It's like 51 and 18. But anyway, it's like 84% um, was, was uh, um, received in one method or another. So yeah, just no, to follow up to based on the questioning from last week. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that because I was actually just about to talk about that because I thought those were very nice stats and a yeah. lot of useful info in there. Yeah. And um, 
And it was also noted that a number of people actually um, were complaining about getting the calls too. So, you know, it's one of those, <laughs> you, you can't win no matter what <laughs> communication method you use. Well, I don't like calls. I don't like email, you know. So I don't want calls. The, I don't want emails. <laughs> I want a dirigible. I want it to fly right. by. I prefer a clay tablet, please dropped on my there doorstep. But so that's why we try all the all the different methods. So, you know, everything other than mailing out, which, you know, that 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 doesn't seem to work as well uh, out of that's probably the least effective out of all of them. So. Right. So that's good. All right. Um, of those positive tests, do we know how many are in the school? Um, I'm trying to think, was that a breakout at all, Jeff? No, I didn't think so. Yeah. I think what was from the last batch, was there five from UMass? I think that was the only breakout that we had. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what was the question about how many people get code read in the schools or how many people have tested? The positive no, test. of the positive cases. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and yeah. how uh, many would... Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, as of January 7th, there were zero uh in frontier or sunderland elementary oh that's good to know yeah. now how many would there be for it to go fully remote is do we have a number that if we had that many cases in the school we would go fully remote i believe the school board does right yeah there there are metrics that the the school committee and um the administration and teachers have, have signed off on to determine the various models of education. Keith, do you happen to remember the number off the top of your head at all? Or Because I, I know you guys review the numbers every time and make a decision based on what's going on at any given moment, so. Yeah, there were like six metrics and not any single one would determine a closure. It was going to be based upon um, a, a review of all of them. And they had to do some of them were the um, the positive test rate in the county, the positive test rate in the state, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the hospital rates or the the ICU rates within at, at Cooley Dick as well. So there was a range of factors that they would take, and okay. they would take them to decide what to do from there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> and okay. Any other um. Items on our COVID update at all, or what else up with that? Look good? Okay. <clears throat> um, so next up, we have um, select board updates. Hmm. I'll start with Scott only because you're. I'm going to go this left to right. You can probably we're probably all in different order on each monitor, but <laughs> the updates you seek are not in this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, carry over from last week, uh, the agenda is finalized and our capital planning first of this budget cycle is scheduled for Wednesday at six. So if people are interested in seeing what that uh, two agenda items are going to be. Um, uh, completion of the 2021 and how do we do, right? We allocated those funds, how do we do? And then secondly, uh, the first pass at the initial request of 2022. Very simple, which means it'll take four hours, but it's very simple. Yeah, right, exactly. <clears throat> All right, Tom, do you have any uh, updates this week? Loaded question, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I thought I'd throw that one out there, though. Um, <sighs> I have a lot to say, but I, I don't, I don't know if it's a proper venue to say them. Yeah, <laughs> we could do more in the um, the public comment section too. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, and then I have uh, I've got a personnel committee meeting with the personnel committee tomorrow night, so we'll be continuing our work on that. <clears throat> and uh, I'll turn it over to Jeff for our town administrator updates, or the town administrator's corner, as it were. Sure. Um, <clears throat> just. Two updates. One thing we got a announcement that the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce is offering a micro grant to local businesses. Um, and as a part of the region, Sunderland, 
businesses can apply. It's five hundred dollars, um, and it can be used for payroll or to try to try something new at the business. And it's sort of related to um, to the hardships that businesses are suffering because of COVID. Um, and we're putting a link up on the website if it's not up there yet under the COVID-19 page about how to apply. So I just wanted to mention that. And then um, we're continuing the, the discussions um, with the building inspector, inspector and RDI about uh, Sanderson Place, mm, formerly yeah. known as um, 120 North Main, Sunderland Senior Housing Project. Um, the uh, general contractor has submitted the building permit application. Um, and so we're figuring out the, the details, but um, I don't know if Laura is on or just joined and was expecting not to. She is there. Hi, Laura. Oh, there she is. <laughs> yes. um, I thought I saw her out there. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I think one of the one of the things in last week, I think it was last week, we we got to the the final plan review um, was sort of the the building permit fee, and I, I talked to the building inspector, and um, I think that the application that was submitted was based on, and, and Laura, you can correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but based on what the, the general contractor's understanding was of the cost of construction. Um, and I think that the, the building permit fee based on that would, would come out to, um, uh, based on, on the cost of construction would come out to about $30,000. And I talked to the building inspector and he said that, you know, his anticipated hours and hourly rate would, would come out to approximately $15,000 for the work on this. This is not including third party inspector or anything. Um, but so I, I wanted to raise it because I know that um, RDI is, is uh, concerned about the cost of, of the permitting, um, not just building permit, but, but the other ones as well. And, um, you know, had, had asked if, if there was something we could do around the building permit fee um, as far as reducing it. And so I don't know. I. I I also want to relay that the, the building inspector doesn't recommend uh, reducing the fee. Thinks that it, it's a um, doesn't want to set a precedent so for future potential developments. Um, but I also understand that this is the type of development that Sunderland has been um, trying to get to happen for a long time and um, has already invested significantly in the project. But wanted to at least raise the issue to see if the select board had any interest in um, reducing the, the building permit fee. Because there was a, a comment that, that, that didn't want the town to lose any money on the fee. So I think that, you know, if we're, if we're covering with the hours that the building inspector says he, he, he anticipates working on Plus the cost of the third party inspector, I think that um, th there is the opportunity to, to reduce the fee, from my understanding, um, from about 30000 to to 15000 if that's something that the select board would be interested in. Are uh, your numbers right, Jeff? Am I? Are my <laughs> yeah. It's right, so the the, right, right, Laura. The original fee was like eighty grand. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's debate about how the fee is calculated, but I, I think we're looking at about fifty thousand dollars plus fifteen thousand dollars for inspection services. Got it. Understood. Okay, I wanted to make sure I was there because the total project cost is not total construction cost. Correct. There's different animals. If you're going to go against your 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 borrowing or whatever your debt schedule, your total right. turnover is. That's that's outfitted. That's nothing right. to do with you know the the kind yeah. of inspection services we're talking about. 
Right, and I surveyed some other towns who have the same formula for um, building permit fees yep. at $10 per thousand dollars of construction costs. And they do take out the plumbing and electrical and HVAC because you're buying other permits for, the, for that right. work. Right. So they're really just looking at the building cost. So it starts to skinny down from that $80,000. Um, be that as it may, we've had a specific request for this project from the building inspector for third party inspection services, which are expensive. Right. Um, they're coming in around 50,000. Um, Jeff, I just sent you something from Louis Hasbrook. He's gonna, there may be another option. We've only been able to get one price for the third party inspection services. Um, so there's not much to compare it to. Um, so yeah, we're just looking for any consideration that the board um, can apply to it um, because we have fees for the Zoning Board of Appeals for an inspecting engineer um, and about $46,000 to connect to do one um, water service connection. So just in the aggregate, it's a lot. It's more than is typical for a project this size. So I'll have to wait and see what the final numbers come in at until we get an idea of our actual numbers. Sounds yeah, I, like. think, I think Jeff's question is it, on the towns where the town has maybe more discretion is the, the fee to the building inspector himself, given that he's going to, you know, contract out the bulk of the work. If his actual hours are estimated to cost 15000 is that the amount that the town would accept recouping? <clears throat> Can I ask two other very quick things? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I'm just wanting to follow up on a sewer uh, availability letter that went to Jeff and I don't yep. know. Which working with the wastewater treatment yep, plan. I'm myself, yep. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> on the way. And uh, in terms of the closing docs, I know that um, Sharon Everett for KP Law conversed with the attorney for RDI. I don't think she's communicated back to the town yet. That was just on Friday, but it, I'm hoping it will be forthcoming in the next week or two that she'll give some guidance. Um, and it, it is all time sensitive in terms of the town's um, documents that it wants as part of the financing closing. So it's just kind of a heads up that it, it's coming. Um, I think she wanted a land development agreement and was going to advise the town sign on to the mass docs affordable housing restriction with a modifier. But I will, you know, you should be seeing more direction come from her shortly. Okay. I hope. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's it. Good. I don't want to take up more of your time. No, that's all right. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So just to clarify, if I could, Mr. Chair, we're getting we're going to get sewer flow volumes uh, from the engineers, Laura, and that helps with Rich's uh, letter. Yeah, I sent that. We got that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. And I lob it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and the balls. Well, in the you're right. You're, you're right near a lift station, so you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't be in a better space. <laughs> there you go. That's good. Something is in our favor. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> okay. All right. Any uh, any other updates, Jeff? Nope. That's all I had. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, joining this week, Laura. You will see me like a bad penny was, I, I until I'm like, done with you. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll see you next week. So That's right. <laughs> there you go. Take care. Right. Thank you Thanks. for being so week. open to letting me drop in. Appreciate it. Not a problem. Yeah. <clears throat> a little easier to do these days on Zoom. So, you know, you can just zoom in and out, I guess, right? Fair point. <clears throat> I have to get my cold car. Yes, that's, I appreciate that's it. That's right. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now why don't we, um, since we don't have Franklin County Tech Night, why don't we go over to the budget, uh, the, the, the Sunderland Public Library. I see them on there so that we don't have to keep them on through our public comment section and everything. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you all? Good, thanks. I, if I could request just one minute, I'd like to, um, Lauren Starve, the vice chair of the Board of Library Trustees had wanted to join me. Um, and I said I would message her if we went on early. Do you mind if I do that? Oh, really no, fast? not at all. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks for joining uh, this week, Elliot, too. It's that time of year.
don't forget everybody though to you don't you don't have to use your cars as much but uh don't make sure you start them every once in a while that's right that's right lots of uh drain battery calls have been going out i bet especially as it gets colder oh, lauren just joined so i'm i'm ready to start if you all are okay sure Great. Right. Well, thank you guys so much for um, for meeting with us to hear our budget presentation. I especially appreciate um, Jeff and the board and everyone allowing the library to go first um, this year. Um, and I also wanted to, you know, just reiterate. Um, I think you all are aware that I will be taking um, some time off this, um, you know, mid February through the spring. Um, but I will still be available to assist with the budget. And Lauren Starr and Beth Barry from the Board of Library Trustees are kind of our budget liaison. So they should also be able to help with the process. So please do continue to reach out to me with any questions or updates about the, the budget process. Um, but do know that, you know, I still will be paying attention to that um, in particular. All right, thanks. Um, so this year, um, we are for our um, library building operating budget line, the first of the lines, um, we are not requesting any increase. We'd like a level funding from um, FY21, which is $23,776. So that's a 0% change. And I did not have any um, figures or justification on that. I want to thank the board for um, and the town um, for providing us with additional funding this past year, which has been much there needed. Um, even though the building is closed to the public, um, we're still seeing an increased need of um, building repairs. Um, we're able to, um, to complete some deferred maintenance that we had put off for many years before when our, our budget was level funded for those past years. So thank you very much for your hard work and allowing us to um, you know, keep up our, our beautiful library building. We're really looking forward to being able to continue to do that in the future with the, the funds provided. Um, the largest request increase that we are requesting is for our library expense line. Um, the library expense line is what we use to pay for our membership to the CWMR's library consortium and to pay for library materials. Um, while it looks like we're requesting a 50% increase in this category, that's actually not the case. Um, what we're, all we, re we are requesting is what we requested for FY21, but we're not provided with. Um, and so in FY, for the FY21 budget, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic caused a lot of problems for the town um, and for the library. And so we were requested that we reduce our, our budget request, um, the overall budget. And so instead of cutting back staff, which we're not able to do, um, we decided that we would take the entire cut from the library expense line. So all we're trying to do is get back to where, where we needed to be this year, um, this in this coming year. Um, and so what we're requesting is $30,000. It is an increase of $10,079. But if you also look at our budget request for this year, we've already expended 94.58% of what the town has provided us with. Um, you know, we're halfway through the year and that money is gone. Um, and so what we'll do now for the remainder of the year in order to, you know, pay for essential materials um, is that we need, are now going to rely on private donations. Um, so I think it's really important to note that um, the funds that the town provides us is almost never enough for us to meet um, state requirements um, for purchasing. And I'll explain that a little bit more later on. Um, and so I think, um, you know, the, the big thing I mentioned is the, the materials expenditure requirement, which is established by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, and so this is a, re a requirement in order for us to you know, maintain our certification as a public library in Massachusetts. We're required to spend a, a portion of our budget, uh, you know, a certain portion of our budget on materials. And so our material expenditure requirement for this year is $26,835 and four cents. Um, and so in order for us to meet this, um, you know, with the town funds provided, um, less our CWMR's membership, we need to raise about $16,000 um, in order to do this. And as you all know, this is a very difficult year for fundraising. Um, 
And um, we're very lucky that we have a group of hardworking volunteers known as the Friends of Sunderland Public Library who are working hard to raise these funds, but it's going to be a huge ask this year. Um, and, you know, the majority of donors to the Friends of Sunderland Public Library are taxpayers in Sunderland. So they're already funding the library through their taxes. And then they're being extra generous by donating extra funds so that we can maintain our essential state certification. Um, I did put a graph in the, um, in the justification that I think is pretty telling. It's called library expense needs versus requests. I'm not sure if Jeff is able to share that or not, um, but what it does show is that, um, you know, our CWMRS membership and the MER is what the library is required to spend in a year and what we would ideally like to spend out of that library expense line. Um, and then it also shows how that compares to the funds we receive from the town of Sunderland and then private funds um, that we spend on materials um, as well as our request. And our request is almost always less okay. than, um, than what we need. We do expect to raise funds. Um, it's just every year we need to raise more and more funds um, and it's just becoming untenable at this point for us to continue to ask that of our donors. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning um, that the cost of materials continues to increase. Um, every year, um, this seems to go up more and more. Um, and you probably don't need to, to hear it, but you know, essentially average cost of books has increased by 1.4%. Um, and then the average cost of DVDs um, last year increased by 12%. And then this year has increased by a, third, a further 35%. I mean, DVDs are the largest jump for sure. Mm -hmm. Average cost of CD audiobooks also did not increase dramatically last year, but it, this year, past year, it has increased by 14.25%. Um, you know, that's just a small example of the increased cost of loanable materials that libraries are facing. Um, I think it's also worth noting that um, you know, the pandemic has caused the library to adjust all aspects of our service, um, and that includes the materials that we're purchasing. Um, from mid-March to June of this year, while we were fully closed to the public, um, we did not purchase any of um, any um, hard materials, so no books, no audiobooks, no DVDs, and we focused all of our funds on digital content. Um, and we were only spending about half of our regular budget. So we did significantly cut back on what we were spending altogether just to be more cautious. Um, and then, well, curbside pickup of the library materials started in June. Um, we did not start purchasing hard copy materials until the FY21 funds became available in July. Um, and so even then, because our budget has been reduced so significantly, um, we're working under a much reduced budget and we are purchasing a lot less items. Um, it's just the bare minimum of what we need to meet the um, materials expenditure requirement. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to note is that um, in 2019, we saw an increased use of digital materials. Um, and this growth has definitely continued through 2020 as the you know, ease and safety of accessing print materials has become more difficult. Um, and also people are just seeking out, I think, more home-based educational and entertainment opportunities. Um, so the cost of um, of ebooks and e-audiobooks is included in our CW Mars membership. Um, we do occasionally purchase additional items to um, increase access for Sunderland residents. And then the library also subscribes to Canopy Streaming Films, which is not included in our membership to CW Mars. Um, and so that provides our patrons with access to free, um, you know, uh, free streaming films, documentaries, children's items, and, and learning courses as well. Um, and use of Canopy has increased by 206% this past year. Um, and we, and it should be noted, we use our state aid to regional libraries grant funds to pay for the canopy services. Um, but the state aid to regional libraries grant funds are only provided to libraries that maintain their certification. So that's an important reason why we need to maintain our certification. Um, so that was, that's it for my justification on the library materials budget request. I'm happy to entertain questions about it now, or if you'd rather that I continue on to our request for library support staff and library director, I can do that as well. Uh, did we have any questions right now at all for Catherine? Oh. I've got one, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Catherine, last year there was some challenges with the licensing of the eBooks. Has that been settled out over the course of the year? 
Mm. No. no. So eBooks are incredibly expensive. Right. Um, and the way the licensing works is that the library purchases um, limited access to, yep. to it. Rather than we purchase a book, we own the book, we can use the book as many times as we want. We're essentially per you know, spending, I would say three times as much um, the cost of a, of a physical book to, for an ebook. And then we can only use that ebook say 12 times before um, we need to buy another copy. Um, and that has not changed. In fact, the cost of eBooks has increased. Um, and so that's why we rely really heavily on our CWMRS membership, which does include access to hundreds of thousands of eBooks included in that membership. Um, and then very rarely will the library purchase additional um, electronic materials just to kind of supplement, um, which increases access for our patrons because the, the wait times on the CWMRS copies can be a very long time. Great, thank you. And I should also say that that's um, librarians are working hard with publishers to come to some kind of agreement that makes right. sense, but the publishers are not amenable to that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yes. <clears throat> that's all I had, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. <clears throat> you can continue if you want with your. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so for the both the library support staff salary line and the library director salary line, we're requesting a 2% increase. Um, and this 2% increase is really just based on what we assume the, um, the personnel committee is gonna recommend as a cost of living increase. So it's not a salary increase. We're just hoping that the town will support a cost of living increase for our staff as the cost of living has increased this year. Um, however, I do think it's worth noting um, the incredible work our staff has been doing in, especially this year. Um, library staff are always hard workers, you know, I'll say that every single year, but the pandemic has, you know, put forward immense challenges for absolutely everyone. But the library staff have really risen to the occasion to make sure that library services are available, even when the building is closed. Um, so even though we were, we've were we been close to the public for the majority of 2020, um, library support staff have worked over 60 hours a week to provide essential services to our community. Um, this includes home delivery of library materials to our vulnerable patrons. We're fulfilling an average of 520 curbside pickups appointments per month. Um, that means we're putting items outside the library building for people to pick up rather than having them come inside the building. We're also answering an average of 542 phone calls per month. Um, creating curated lists of library materials, um, providing selections of children's materials for teachers and families. Um, we've been putting together take-home craft kits for people of all ages to enjoy. And we're also offering um, virtual programs, about 10 per month. Um, and so we're working incredibly hard. Um, I think it, it's also worth noting that um, for services such as curbside service, usually it's a a patron could just walk into the building, pick up their books, bring them to us, we check them out. It's very little work for the staff to manage that. But a curbside pickup order, um, we need to receive the, the order from the patron. We need to pick up that item. We need to arrange a pickup time for the patron. We need to safely package that item, make sure it's clean and sanitary for them. And then we need to put it outside at their appointment time. Um, and we're doing you know, well over 500 a month it's about 30 to 50 a day. It's, um, it's a lot of extra work for our staff. Um, you know, in addition to this, we're also offering an average of eight 30 minute computer appointments per week. Um, we really felt it was important that we provide computer access to our patrons who don't have it. Um, and so we are allowing people in a very limited way into the building to, to use computers for this essential work. Um, you know, people are using these appointments to apply for jobs, file for unemployment, complete important insurance documentation, request food and housing support. Um, you know, it's really critical that, you know, most of the services that people rely on have moved online um, due to the pandemic. So having technology available for patrons to use is really critical at this time. Um, and, and, you know, all of this is done in addition to our regular library work. Um, so I think, you know, even though the work that the library staff are providing looks very different from previous years. I think the amount of work that they're doing has increased drastically. Um, and, you know, it'd be a lot safer for them to continue to work from home, but they've made every effort to provide critical services to our town as safely as possible and when our people have needed these services the most. So I really think they should be commended for, um, for all the hard work that they're doing. 
Um, I also included some graphs about circulation. Um, I think our staff should be praised for even when we were closed to the public entirely in April, May, and um, the first half of June, we still circulated over a thousand items <laughs> to people through home deliveries and curbside pickup and digital items. Um, and our, you know, even though we've been closed to the public and doing curbside pickup, our circulation um, has only decreased by 36%. You know, we're still well over half of the circulation of what we've done when we're open. Um, so I think it's really um, commendable. Can I, can I jump in for a minute? Yes, please. I just also on behalf of the trustees want to, um, you know, thank the, our staff for making a tremendous effort to provide essential services to the town. And it's, um, you know, as, as for everyone, it's an ever changing landscape and they've been incredibly flexible and very dedicated to wanting to um, provide as much service as we can uh, safely. Uh, in addition to everything that Catherine mentioned, there's a lot of cleaning going on, a lot of disinfecting of materials. So every little step of the way is just a much more labor intensive activity than it was previously. And I'd also like to acknowledge the volunteers that we have in helping um, get some of that stuff done. Absolutely, our volunteers are the ones who are doing the bulk of the, the cleaning of materials. Um, which is incredibly labor intensive, um, but I feel it's an extra step that's really necessary to, to make people safe and, and make them feel comfortable um, using our, our library materials. Um, so that, that concludes my, my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions folks have. Uh, you mentioned call volume. How much more of, is that now versus before? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. I so said you mentioned your call volume was up. How much was it over like um, normal call volume? That's over 200%. <laughs> it's okay. yeah. calls. Um, I would say today we received um, 47 phone calls before I left at four o'clock. Um, oh. And so that's, you know, it's like one or two people in the building at, at any one time answering, answering several phone calls per hour. It's um, the phone's ringing off the hook and I want to apologize to our patrons too. A lot of times it might go to voicemail, even though staff are there, and that's because we're on the other line. <laughs> oh, you know, have one of those lovely phone systems to dump them into, right? And have, yeah. that's that's <laughs> greatly appreciated. Thank you. I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, Catherine, Lauren, um, like so many other things that have gone on in in uh, this 2020 uh, uh, pandemic environment, how many of these? Um, new methods do you anticipate uh, will actually become permanent? I think curbside pickup will definitely be a permanent feature. Um, yep. Even when the library reopens, I don't think everyone's gonna feel safe coming into the building. And I think a lot of people appreciate the convenience of just having their items already checked out to them and, and being outside. I expect that to be a permanent change. I also expect the, um, digital, um, you know, usage, usage of our digital materials to be a permanent increase as well. Um, that's been growing well before the pandemic, but especially now that people have been kind of forced to, to you know, adopt right. these new materials, um, yep. they're gonna find that they like them, that they're really convenient um, yep. and that there's wonderful resources out there. Great. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions for Catherine or uh, Lauren at all? All right, thanks. We thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. We appreciate all thank the hard, hard work you guys are doing. So, yeah. Yeah, thank thanks. you very much. It's been a it's been a crazy year, but uh, hopefully we're coming out the other side. Right. Here's hoping. Yep. All right. <laughs> thanks. Oh, I want to also point out on and on top of everything else, we ran two elections. Right. Yeah. How was that? Exactly. That's right. So. so thank you to Wendy, um, as well as the library staff, but Wendy was the real one making sure everyone was safe while we were doing that. So thank you, Wendy, for making those elections run. So I would say we didn't run the elections. Wendy ran the elections. We, yeah. we housed them. <laughs> we hosted them. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just, I, I think it's a really interesting question, Scott, about how, you know, I think it's a question for everyone about how things will change and what will, what we will have learned from this. But I would agree that, you know, I think, the digital, the pickup, and uh, just 
different methods, people using the building in different ways. Right. Yep. It's constantly evolving. Oh yeah, it's probably worth noting too, the home delivery is actually not a new service. It's something that we've offered to patrons who couldn't leave their homes um, at any time, but um, you know, for any reason, but that's everyone these days. So um, I'm assuming the home delivery will also be an increased demand in the future and we're happy to Makes continue sense. that. Sort of a door dash for libraries, I guess, right? All right, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys, we appreciate it. All right. Um, I think we've now reached the um, public comment portion of the evening. <clears throat> Anybody have any public comments at all? Hey, Keith, go ahead. Um, yeah, we. I just wanted to check in about you know budgets mm. both here in Sunderland. Uh, we had a budget. Subcommittee meeting for Frontier last week and um, wasn't a lot of movement because we don't have any of the state numbers yet. So it's it's hard to, to project um, the numbers out. And then there was some concern about um, that the select board had requested a um, budget presentation and they weren't sure about what they would be able to present just yet. So um, I don't know if uh, Franklin County Tech is in the same boat, if, if they weren't able to Present tonight because of that. I, it sounds like I know they weren't. I know they weren't ready, right, Jeff? I don't know that they got into any details, but I, and it, yeah. we're all kind of in that same boat, I think, with a lot of unknowns about the budget. Yeah, and I, I spoke with the superintendent earlier today, and uh, he expressed the same thing and and said that um, he wasn't sure. I think Frontier, the schools are scheduled for third or fourth week in February. Um, and he said, even, even then, th it, there might not be clarity depending on what the federal government decides to do and what the state's looking at doing and how that all trickles down to municipal budgets. Um, but said he was certainly willing to, to come in and talk about what they do know what they what what can be shared and, and start having that discussion of what what it looks like we talked about you know revolving funds and and how obviously <laughs> it, it's hard when when those programs aren't running you know food and things like that and and the deficits that they're running and, and how that works so um, I think that that's probably what's going to wind up happening is they're going to come in and, and share the information that's available um, with the understanding that there are unknowns. And, um, and I think that's that's for all of us, too. We're, we're still not sure whether when the preliminary cherry sheets are going to come out. And um, so I think we under, understand that. And then this, uh, this Sunderland School Committee meeting is tomorrow night. I think we are going to be talking about budgets then. And I think that we would be in the same boat there, too. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of similarities to last year in terms of budgeting and timing and everything. So, right. <clears throat> along yeah. along those lines, if I could, Mr. Chair, mm. Keith, a week ago we we um, asked for our next week's agenda to include uh, comments from the town clerk uh, as well as the moderator about maybe postponing town meeting to June, right. and that would that would extend the budget process because not unlike the schools, we want good information ourselves. And it's really difficult for us to forecast without those cherry sheet numbers, without, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat, I guess is what I'm saying. So those dates may slide a little uh, after after next week, once a date and once we have a discussion about it and uh, take some of the uh, short term pressure off um, and allow for even a greater review of the budget if it's later <laughs> in the year. <laughs> We can have an end, exciting, more in-depth look at it. Exactly. That's right. So that did come up. There was some concern about um, when the town meeting would occur because they were trying hard to, to meet the, the, the dates, you know, over many right. out they have to do it. So there, there was a question um, if the town, and it seems that it, the town meeting will be pushed back to some degree. We're going to have that discussion yeah. next week. And uh, my, incl my, my inclination is that it would be uh, – prudent as long as we're still allowed to do it through the emergency declaration that we had last year 
we confirm that. Uh, I think it would be prudent to look at that as a as a really useful tool to inform the town and uh, be uh, as thorough as we can in these uncertain, continued uncertain times. All right. <clears throat> well, that's. I just wanted to check in for the the, the yeah. body of health. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Good question. Oh, there's our town clerk. I. I did want to pop in. Um, I, I've been checking on this. The legislator has um, okayed delaying town meeting up to March 31st of this year. The Secretary of State's office is talking back and forth because obviously all our town meetings are after March 31st. Right. So yeah. the expectation that that will happen. Um, we are hopeful, but it has not happened yet. Good. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now we get the the end of our public comment. Any uh, any comments at all, Tom? Or I know we did get a letter. Oops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> are you going to address the letter, Davy? Yeah, I can, I can, Jeff, can you pull it up? I yeah, think we can probably all talk about it. And then, because we did get a letter uh, <clears throat> discussing the unfortunate events of the past week. All right. <clears throat> I can I can read the, the I can't can you shrink it just a tad only because it's I don't know if you can actually. Um, probably. You know, it's because the attendee panel kind of blocks some of it. Can you? Does that work? Yeah. I'm resizing it on my screen. I don't know what yeah. it looks like. It, yeah, it, it moved a little bit, but the, the, the essentially the. the you can see the gist of it is that a letter was sent to Representative McGovern's and our essentially all our congressional representatives about the incidents last week and then calling for a law requiring all presidential candidates to reveal their tax returns, um, a law reforming the presidential's the president's pardon powers and a provision that the president cannot pardon himself. And I think that one's probably still up for discussion if that's even possible anyway. But, and then also the ability to criminally indict and or charge a president while in office. And um, a law that's more specific regarding the illegal use of the president of the United States for personal and or political gain. And basically this is all kind of <clears throat> addressing the incidents that occurred last week and a number of other things that led up to that. <clears throat> did, you, um, did you wanna have, have any specific comments, Tom? Uh, if, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, for, first, uh, I'd like to thank um, the committee that sent the the letter, referenced the letter to us, so that we had an opportunity to read it. One, yeah. one of the things at the uh, in the email they asked um, for the board um, to um, join and send letter also. Um, I'll speak for myself on on that issue. I I believe that the Sunland Board of Selectmen is, or the Sunland Select Board is is governed with the town business, um, and I I I I believe the last time three members of the board independently um, and we didn't work as a as a board made a recommendation we were taken to task because we they there there was a belief that we were representing the town without talking to the town um, and, and again I, I understand how how that could that could be perceived because we we did operate, although we did operate independently, um, but it was not well taken. And, and I think at that time, 
um, we reiterated that the that the uh, the select board. Um, it's hard for us to unilaterally speak for the residents of our town. It's right. it's just a very it's a very difficult thing. Um, so we typically don't, um, right. or we haven't. I, on a personal on a personal note, Representative McGovern um, is a member of the leadership of the Democratic Party, and is one of the the chairman of one of the most important committees um, in Washington, D.C. In fact, if if anybody watched any of the, the news or read on the, um, or followed it as I did on the internet, uh, Representative McGovern was um, one of the only um, congressmen during the whole insurrection. And I did say that purposely insurrection, because I do believe it was, um, that was mentioned by name. And you could see him at a very um, critical junction uh, in the speaker's lobby. Um, I, I know uh, Representative McGovern knows what the sentiment of his district is. And the three members of the board of select the select board from Sunderland are are not going to, um, my opinion, influence him very greatly because, a, I don't think it differs a lot from his opinions right now. Right. Also, personally, I will say that it that January six was probably someone, and and I. Never thought of myself before as this, but we are politicians. We do run for election. Uh, Keith McFarland uh, on the school committee is a politician. Um, I, but he will also he will also tell you the great pride that we all have when you are in your first election and you find out that there is someone besides yourself voted for you. Um, Democracy is a precious. Democracy is a precious. Is a very precious item. It should have been a wake-up call to every single one of us how easily we could lose that gift that we have that's known as democracy. Um, I, I personally enjoy. The fact that I live in a democracy, I've I've traveled in many countries where people don't have that opportunity. Um, I'm stupefied beyond belief that American citizens acted the way they did. I I I'm I'm un immensely grieved that four lives, five lives were lost. And that now I'm listening about potential concerns of President-elect Biden, Vice President Harris, um, and the overtaking of our government again and, and capitals across the country by armed individuals. It's got to stop. In my opinion, thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. <clears throat> Those are uh, somber words, that's for sure. And I never thought I'd see uh, what I saw on the TV that day. It uh, not good. <clears throat> I agree with you, Tom. All right. Do we have um, any other comments at all? All set, David. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, that actually is the last of our official business for this evening. <clears throat> um, so next week we have our meeting on Tuesday, January 19th, because Monday the 18th will be Martin Luther King Day, which will be a holiday. So we'll be meeting next Tuesday at, it is 6.30, right, Jeff? Yeah. Yep. So it'll be next Tuesday at 6.30. So 
just folks keep that in mind. Um, and if there's nothing else, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. I'll second. All right. All those in favor of adjournment at uh, 733? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks for uh, joining folks, and we'll see you next week.